Other than that, all good. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this talk on forecasting, which I appreciate is a very niche topic, and most people don't like forecasting in Salesforce. So before we get started, hands up if you've used Salesforce forecasting. Nobody? Okay, good. Because that means you're coming at this with fresh eyes, because historically forecasting in Salesforce was terrible. Really, really bad. So my name is Christine Marshall. I work for Salesforce Ben as the course's director. I'm a Salesforce MVP, and I also run my local Salesforce admin community group in Bristol in the UK. So what we're going to look at today, we're going to dive into forecasting. And first of all, we're going to look at what is it? Why do we need it? And then I'm going to jump into the features, both some older features, which have been enhanced, and also the new features, of which there are many. Then we're going to look at how to set it up and how easy that is. And finally, I've got 10 best practices to really get the most out of your forecasting setup and implementation. So let's start with the what and the why of Salesforce forecasting. So what is it? Well, it's the process of making predictions on future sales based on historical and present data. And there's a real misconception around forecasting that it's all about money, that it's about the amount field. But it's not just for that, it's also for forecasting product. So if we were to imagine that we worked for a company that made magazines, where we deliver our magazines monthly and people pay us on a monthly subscription, it would actually be really useful to know how many magazines we need to make every month for delivery. And forecasting can be used for that as well. And it's really, really important. All businesses should be forecasting, are forecasting, because it informs our business critical decisions. It's how we set our budgets, it's how we set our targets, it's how we know how much stock to order or build, and it's how we can identify gaps in the pipeline. And proactive identification of gaps in our pipeline is essential for making sure that we can hit our targets as a business. So why then should you use Salesforce for forecasting? Well, number one, it comes out of the box. If you have Sales Cloud, you already have forecasting available to you. And I think this year, what we've noticed is a really difficult period of time within the Salesforce ecosystem. We've had a lot of redundancies. Salesforce made significant redundancies. A lot of the consultancies made quite a lot of redundancies. And we're noticing that businesses are very reluctant to spend. They don't want to buy more licenses. They don't want to buy more products because financially things have been a bit precarious. So I think if you're a Salesforce professional and you can get a greater return on investments on your existing Salesforce instance, then that makes you a very valued employee. So we can use something like forecasting to show businesses how we are getting more ROI for them using features that we already have. It reduces the need for spreadsheets and we all know we want to move away from spreadsheets. And your CRM, your Salesforce, is typically where your live sales data is. So it makes sense to use the same tool. And what we're going to see is that it's now very powerful and dynamic. So users will enjoy using it more than using spreadsheets. It provides you with a single source of truth. One of the biggest problems with using something like spreadsheets is as soon as you've exported the data into a spreadsheet, it's already out of date because sales are so fast moving. It's also flexible to the needs of any business. I am gonna talk about who it's suitable for and where it may not be suitable, but it's easily customizable, so we can customize it using clicks, not code. And I thought it would be fun to talk a little bit about the history of forecasting because it's actually been around for a long time. So there was an initial instance of forecasting way, way back that you can't find any documentation on anymore. But then came customizable forecasting, which was also a long, long time ago. And that's what was in place when I started my Salesforce career. Then forecasts was released, and this goes on to become collaborative forecasting. 
customizable forecasting is retired in the summer 20 release. And then I started to notice with every new Salesforce release, there were more and more forecasting updates being delivered. And I started thinking, what's going on? Everybody hates forecasting. We never update forecasting. So I had a call with the product team at Salesforce to say, what are you doing? Why am I seeing so many updates coming through every release? And they were very candid and said that forecasting in Salesforce had not been a priority and some of the competitor forecasting modules were better. And they wanted to change that. They wanted to update forecasting in Salesforce so that it would meet the expectations of their customer. So they have a whole team dedicated to this who are working on enhancements all the time. And you can expect to see more and more of these enhancements over the next few years. So this is the purpose of this talk, because when I was using forecasting initially, it really wasn't fit for purpose. There were lots of things you couldn't do for it. And when I spoke to other people, they had exactly the same feedback. They said, it just can't meet my business needs, so we don't use Salesforce for forecasting. And that's why I want to show people all of the new features that it now has. So let's jump into the features and what you need to know about Salesforce forecasting. So let's just take a quick look at an overview. And there will be a recording where the definition of this is a little bit higher. But this is what forecasting looks like at the moment. And if you've never seen it before, it probably looks quite nice. If you had seen forecasting before, it probably looks quite amazing because it's undergone a significant facelift. It used to look very much like, uh, well, classic, Salesforce classic. And now it's been given a lightning facelift. So we've got lots of things that we can do with forecasting, and it's easy for managers and their users to use as well. So as a user, you can go and look at your forecast. If you're a manager, you can look at your own, but also your teams. And this is a dynamic page as well. So whenever you click on anything, if you click on a user to view their forecast, if you change the, uh, the quarter for the forecast, then this at the bottom here, is a dynamic list of opportunities. So that will change depending on the criteria that you've selected. Next, I want to talk to you about the forecast hierarchy. So this is probably one of the most important things that you need to consider if you're going to set up forecasting. Now, it looks like the role hierarchy, but it is not. And it doesn't need to follow the role hierarchy. What the forecast hierarchy does is it defines the forecast manager, the team. So who in that team is responsible for the forecast of the people underneath them? So this is something that you want to do. And it rolls up just like the role hierarchy. And that's important because it gives managers visibility of their team to do some pretty cool things. So first up, managers can view as one of their team. So they can drill down into the team member to see what opportunities they have. So I've got a little GIF here. And so this manager can select the user that they want to see, drill down into that person's forecast. And as they do, the dynamic opportunity list at the bottom updates and the values along the top in the forecast categories, which we'll talk about, will also update. So it's very intuitive for managers to use. And this can be used in meetings, in sales meetings on the spot to see a real-time view of the forecast and what's missing. So we can also forecast on a particular date range. And again, it's very easy to drill into that date range as a manager or as a user. So in this view here, up on this side of the screen, you're going to see that you can select what you want to forecast. And once again, your forecast will dynamically update. All of the values in commit, in best case, in pipeline are going to change, and your opportunity list will change as well. So getting your forecast hierarchy right is a really critical step. So let's talk then about forecast types. And historically, this was the thing that really tripped people up, that they didn't understand what is a forecast type. Well, let's explore that now. So why do we need forecast types? Well, they determine what is being forecast. And we can come back to that example of products and values. 
So they determine the specific measure, whether you want to look at revenue, something like your opportunity amount field, whether you want to look at the quantity of opportunity line items or a custom value. And again, we're going to look at that in a bit more detail because you're not just limited to standard fields like amount, you can forecast on custom fields. So perhaps you want to forecast on your profit. You know, we don't have a standard profit field, but you might have a custom one and you could forecast on that as well. We can choose the date type. So whether we want to use the close date of an opportunity or the product, a schedule, but more importantly, again, a custom date. Because an opportunity close date typically is when you close a deal. It's when the contract gets signed and you mark it as one in Salesforce. But do you see any money then? No, not often. Typically, you have a 30-day, a 60-day, a 90-day schedule. So actually, you're not going to get any money in that month. And you probably are recording that date in Salesforce. And that's likely the date you want to forecast on. And you can do that now. And then we can choose the hierarchy. So we looked at the role hierarchy, the forecast hierarchy, and also if you're using territory management, it does support that as well. And additionally, and this is key, is you can now add custom filters, which I'm going to show you, to each of your forecast types. And this is important because in the past, you couldn't even forecast new, new business versus existing business. And they are so difference. The likelihood of winning is so much higher with existing customers than it is with new customers that forecasting them together can really alter your forecast and make it less accurate. But now you can add filters so you can forecast on specific opportunities and exclude others. So forecast types are really simple to set up and I appreciate the resolution is a little hazy here so I'll talk you through it. But the first one I wanted to show you was how you could forecast on a custom opportunity amount. So with forecasts, you can set up four types. So you have to determine how many types of forecasts you want. And then there's a wizard to guide you through. So the first thing you're going to do is pick your object. In this example, I'm going to use the opportunity. Then I'm going to specify a measure. So this is whether you want to use the amount field or a custom uh, revenue value. Next, we can select our date range. So again, do I want my close date? Do I want a custom date? Then I can choose my hierarchy. This is just whether or not we have territory management and then additional filters. So this is where we could say, I only want to forecast on record type equals new business, or I only want to forecast if this field is existing customer. So we can use that and it really is that simple. And then we can customize what fields we want to show as well. And again, don't forget, we've got four forecast types and each one can show different fields. So in this example, I'm scrolling through and I'm going to add my next steps field into my forecast view. So you can customize this. And what will happen is at the bottom of the screen where we have our dynamic list of opportunities, that's where those fields are going to display. So let's take a look at another example. And this is opportunity line item. So again, let's think back to that example of magazines. I want to know how many magazines I need to make and ship every month. And that's also very, very simple. The wizard will walk us through it again. And the first difference is we're going to choose our object. But in this example, I'm choosing my line item, so my product. And then I'm also going to choose my quantity here. So it's not a monetary value, it's the quantity of products that I need to make. And again, same steps, hierarchy, we can add filters, and then we can add fields if we need to. And so it's that easy to create our forecast types. Now what we do need to think about is what do we want to forecast? And that's a question for the business. What do you want to forecast? You've got four that you can create, what shall we do? Shall we do uh, opportunity amount and close date? Shall we then do profit and payment date? Shall we do products if we use that? And your business can decide that for you. So next let's talk about forecast categories. 
So we have standard forecast categories in Salesforce. And what this is doing is this is grouping opportunities together into categories. And it's based on the opportunity stage and it's editable, which I'm going to show you. But the standard ones are pipeline, best case, most likely, which was new in winter 22, commit, closed, and omitted. And when you look at the forecast screen, you won't see omitted at all. They're just not there. We've omitted them completely. We'll be able to see our closed, we can see our commits, and it's very, very easy then, these values are added up under those categories. So if an opportunity is closed, then it's going to fall under the closed category. Now, you might want to change these because the standard setup may not make sense for you. So if we take an example, the very first stage of an opportunity, uh, do we really want to forecast that? If our sales users are putting them in at that first stage, and if we know sales users, and I think we do, they're quite unreliable, um, we maybe we don't want to forecast that because it's so early in the opportunity that actually we're probably not going to get that opportunity to close. So perhaps we want to omit that one completely. And we can do that by coming into opportunity, to fields, to the stage field, and it's from here that we can adjust those forecast categories. So you can simply go into any stage that you have and you can change it to become omitted in the forecast and that takes effect straight away. So it means that it is very customizable to your business and to the logic of your business. Okay, single and cumulative forecasts. This is real financial talk. So we can forecast either singly or cumulatively. And what this means is if we do a single forecast, then the forecast categories will show only those opportunities. So if we have the commit category, then only opportunities where the stage equals commit will show there. That's all the value we'll get. But then we have the option of cumulative. And that means that these categories start getting added together. And this is how it works. So closed, still closed only. But commit is closed and commit, rolled up together into a total figure. Most likely is closed, commit, and most likely rolled up together. And new from summer 22, you can now customize these names as well. So again, historically with forecasting, you couldn't customize anything. You couldn't customize the naming and the terminology, which really put a lot of businesses off. But now you can customize it to meet your own business's terminology and jargon, which I find really encourages users and gets that buy-in and user adoption from them. Now, the question you might have is, how do I know if I want single or cumulative forecasts? And the answer is, you don't. But your business will. So the finance department, the sales directors, they will have an idea of whether they want single or cumulative. So for this step, it's definitely down to the business to let you know what they need. Now, I want to talk about adjustments. And we're also going to talk about something called judgments in just a moment as well. So again, if we think about our sales users, they're all excited and they put things in Salesforce, it's not accurate. They put things in and then say, absolutely, I'm going to win this $2 million deal. And they're not. And their managers know they're not. Their managers know their team much, much better. So they'll know that uh, this sales team member always over predicts. He always says he's going to win everything, but actually he closes about 30% of his deals. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you'll have another sales team member who's really cautious and lacks confidence. So they don't want to commit anything, but actually they close 70% of their deals. But if it was down to them, the forecasting would be really inaccurate. And their manager knows that. So manager adjustments allow the manager to actually change the values without it affecting the opportunity underneath. So they can change the value at the forecast level, so the forecast reflects that change, but the opportunity value stays the same. And again, I've got a little short video for you where they can override it. So, and you can decide whether or not they can do this. Little pencil, they can adjust it, 
and they can also put notes about why they've made the change, which are then visible on Hover. And again, all of this can be done live. If we're in a sales meeting with the sales team, the managers can do this on the spot. So that brings me nicely on to manager judgments. Now, manager judgments is new for winter 24, so it's only just come out. And it's similar to adjustments. It means that managers can incorporate their own judgment on a deal, which means including opportunities that the rep has not yet committed. So managers can mark deals as in or out, and if they mark them as in, then they show under the commit category. And it's just another way to allow those sales managers that know their team a bit better, or maybe they know the customer better, and they have more confidence in a deal, or less confidence, they can mark them out as well. They can get, take them out of the commit category. So these ways, we can really get a more accurate forecast, and accurate forecasting is a really hard thing to do. Now, one of the features that I'm really excited about, which again was new in one of the recent releases, is the ability to show the changes. So show changes in the last seven days is an option that users and managers can toggle on and off from that forecasting screen. And it shows information about that opportunity, what's happened to it, any adjustments to it. And it's very, very visually pleasing. So it will show you if the value has increased, if the value has decreased, and when this happens and the impact. Again, making it very visually stimulating, I think is important for adoption. And again, really simple in a meeting to simply hover and see what's happened so that we can question on the spot why things have changed. Quotas and quota attainment. And again, going back 10 years ago, adding quotas was really, really difficult to Salesforce and a lot of people didn't put them in. But in my opinion, forecasts really don't work without quotas. And again, I think the reason is the psychology behind sales teams and sales and forecasting and targets. It really helps them to work towards a target. So you can see here, we've got this nice visual bar, this colored bar, which shows us how close we are to our quota or our target according to what's in the forecast. And it just shows at a glance how close or how far away we are from where we need to be. Something else that's been new over the past year is what I call custom calculated columns. So this is where you can set up columns to show things that you want to, your users to see, and you can think of them like formulas. So in this example, which I will show you, what I've done is I've created a custom column called gap to quota. So if we're using quota, we're importing our target. And then I've created it's a simple formula in a column here, and it's now showing me what is the gap then to my quota. And it's doing that calculation for me so that I can see on the screen. And I again appreciate it's not very easy to see, but you can set these up for each forecast type. So again, these custom columns, these custom calculations can be specific to your forecast types. So maybe you want different ones for new business or existing business or for revenue and product quantity. And it's really, really simple. So all I did was I gave it a name. I've used a formula, which you can't see here, but if you Google it, you can find these sort of formulas and saved it. And then that's it. I've added it to my forecast and it will then appear on the page. So again, a really simple way to enhance so let's talk about the how. So it's very, very simple. There's a wizard to walk you through. So you've got setup, you can enable it. New customers will have this enabled automatically. We want to create and activate at least one forecast type, but again, we've got four that we can set up. And then it's gonna talk you through the various steps and you can choose, do you want to enable adjustments? Do you want to enable manager judgments? Do you want single or cumulative roll-ups? So all of that, it's gonna walk you through on the page. Very, very simple. But what I do want to finish up with is some best practices for you to keep in mind when you're embarking on a forecast setup. And these are really questions and things for the business that needs to happen. So the first thing is to evaluate your company's maturity and data quality, because forecasting 
If it's inaccurate, it's not going to work. You're not going to get any buy-in. So you need accurate data. So that's the first thing to do. Maybe you need a data cleansing project before you launch forecasting. Review and document your existing processes. You need to understand what each department is doing, who's using forecasting, and what they need, and then simplify it where possible. Try and standardize your processes, and this is the hardest one. If you're working with different divisions, different departments within a business, they may all want different things. And it's at this point that I would flag that as far as forecasting has come, it is still limited. So think back to the four forecast types. We only have four. You can get that extended by Salesforce to a couple more, but it may not be suitable if you work for a big, big business. Collaborate with your stakeholders. What needs to be measured? And tell them what you can measure. Educate them. It's not just the opportunity amount field. You can have custom fields. We can forecast on products. They may not know that. Ask your business if they want single or cumulative forecasts. And use quotas where possible. Your engagement's going to be much higher if you have targets in. Now, something that businesses need to understand is not to wait to the end of the month or the end of the quarter to do the forecasting. The whole point of having it in Salesforce and of it being dynamic is to assess it early on. Assess it at the start of the month, in the middle of the month, to enable people the best chance of hitting their quotas and getting an accurate forecast. It needs to be proactive. If it's your first time implementing forecasting, then consider starting with a pilot group and launching an MVP, a minimum viable product. Now, the difficulty here is, again, if you work in a business with multiple divisions and multiple departments, then it may be hard to go live with a pilot group. You need to get all the stakeholders across departments involved so you don't end up building a forecasting product that works for one department and not for everyone else. Don't aim for perfection. That's a really important thing is you will need to tweak it. It's more important to get stakeholders engaged, to get user adoption, and to educate them on what is possible. And then don't fall at the final hurdle. No matter what, you, if you think your implementation is fantastic, and I know that we all think our objects, our custom objects, our implementations are great, it's not great unless you get user buy-in and user adoption. So for a successful project, you need to start with engagement. Start with engagement from the stakeholders, get engagement from your end users as well. And that is all part of having a project and getting feedback throughout the process. And I've got a couple of QR codes for you if you are interested in a bit more information. Salesforce Help actually have a really good uh, help document on collaborative forecast that walks you through the process. And then they also have a complete guide to building a sales forecast, which is more aimed at executives and sales users. But I think if you don't come from a sales background, but you're about to lead a forecasting implementation, that it's really important that you understand what is forecasting, the importance of it, and how the business sees it as well. So I would recommend reading that as well. But with that, that's everything from me. I don't know if we have... So we are out of time, but I'm going to be around. So if you have any more specific questions on forecasting, I'm more than happy to answer them today. And thank you so much for coming to this session.